Look, they're clearly very unhappy with the royal existence that they have at the moment and, and the way that, uh, the way that their, their public life um, impinges on them. It's, it's something they clearly want to change. And many people will have sympathy with that. Um, it's, it's understandable. Um, the, the, the crux of the matter is you can't be half royal. You can be uh, part of the royal machine. You can accept the privileges that go with it, but also take the restrictions and, uh, and all, all that. And, and you, you, you live in a, in, a, in a sort of bubble. Or you can um, stand back. I mean, the, the, the next generation of Dukes of Kent, Dukes of Gloucester, they're private citizens. No one would recognize right. them in the street. You can go down that route if you want. What you can't do is to be uh, sort of transatlantic royals who drop in, do a bit of royal stuff, but then go off to do this sort of financial independent stuff in, in LA or Toronto, wherever it is. I think the whole plan that Harry and Meghan have is a really problematic one because they're talking about stepping back. They're talking, their critics would argue, about having their cake and eat it. They're talking about one day representing the Queen on a foreign tour to a, a, another country, on another day, say, in North America, earning serious money with some sort of endorsement of some sort of product. The, the risk is that those two things aren't compatible. The risk is that their pursuit of money will uh, tarnish the Windsor brand and tarnish the House of Windsor. I mean, this is the real problem for the Queen and uh, Prince Charles. They are dealing with this as a grandmother and as a father on the one hand, and they're also dealing with it as the protector of an ancient dynasty. And we have seen that how, as protectors of the ancient dynasty, when they need to, they act brutally, as they did with Prince Andrew when they removed him from public office. There may be a point that at some stage that the Queen, Charles and William believe that what Meghan and Harry are proposing is a threat to the institution of the British monarchy, then they will act. You know, the monarchy finds itself in a moment of, of turmoil, flux and a genuine crisis because, of course, this has opened up a Pandora's box. There are so many wider issues at stake. The future of the monarchy, this streamlined monarchy that you keep hearing people talking about. What does that actually look like if Meghan and Harry do step down? had their first date at Soho House in London in 2016. And then, of course, you know, with Meghan living and working at the time in Toronto in Canada, where she was filming Suits, and Harry being based in, in London, they realised they would have to really go out their way to make time for each other very quickly. So within a few weeks of that first date, they were on holiday together in Botswana. <laughs> Introduced actually by a mutual friend. It was it was literally it was through her, and then we met once and then twice back to back, two dates in London mm. um, last July. Yes, beginning of July. After keeping their relationship out of the press for so long, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle made their first public appearance at the 2017 Invictus Games in Toronto, showing public displays of affection as they sat in the front row to watch the wheelchair tennis. Meghan Markle is a California girl. In fact, her dad, Thomas, uh, was in the film industry. He worked on set. And one of Meghan's earliest memories, actually, and what she says inspired her to be an actress, was being on set of the show Married with Children, a show that her dad worked on for years as a lighting director, I believe. Meghan grew up very much, um, not so much in the industry, but close, kind of on the periphery of show business. I think she got a real taste of it from a very early age. And Megan was always a natural performer. We've seen videos of her in school plays. We know that she was always um, kind of gravitating towards the stage and being on stage. Megan seemed to do really well with um, the kind of attention and, and scrutiny that came with being an actress. And there's no doubt that really from an early age, Megan always kind of stood out uh, from the rest of her peers. I think Meghan um, had quite a, a difficult 
initial period um, after their relationship was confirmed, and we know this because Harry issued a statement uh, defending her and sort of warning people off. Um, you know, she described it as disheartening and discriminatory, um, but Harry himself uh, mentioned sort of racial undertones, which is pretty upsetting uh, for anyone concerned. Um, and I think, you know, it is a difficult situation when you are thrust into the into the glare of media interest, the, the royal family garner a huge amount of attention. And, um, you know, we know that they're not necessarily delighted by it, but, you know, they work closely with the media to get their messages across. Um, but I think nothing prepared Harry and Meghan for the wave of interest that followed the announcement of their relationship. Um, and in fact, it was Harry's statement that confirmed they were a couple. Uh, for the first time. I, I think it's a really difficult one because they are going to have to get used to the scrutiny, um, but it's only right that she's treated fairly and um, I think it was upsetting for everyone to see that she'd been, you know, caused problems by this coverage. Well, I'm sure at the onset, uh, both my parents and my close friends were concerned because we got very quickly swept up in a media storm that, as I, I shared, was not part of my life before that, but they also had never seen me so happy. And um, and I think also once my friends, excuse me, were able to to really meet Harry and my mom, who we've spent a lot of time with, mm. it was so much fun. Your mom's amazing. It was just, you know, it was just obvious that no matter what we were being put through, that it was just temporary and that we were going to be able to get through that. So everyone was really happy. We've, he's talked to my dad a few times, hasn't been able to meet him just yet. Um, but it's all been, it's all been worth every effort. Mm -hmm. it's been great. On their new website, the Duke and Duchess published what was effectively a manifesto of how they're going to deal with the media in future. And part of it was an attack on this and specifically British media and royal correspondents for their monopoly on royal coverage and essentially accusing the media of making private profit from their very public lives. They talk specifically about the Royal Rota, where British media cover royal events to be distributed around the world. Obviously claims they feel they've been hounded by the media, etc. But in reality, they've had, there's been nothing like that. Um, the, the oh, come royal, on, you would say that. No, the Royal Rota system works, I think it's given them an awful lot of, works very, it's been going since the 1950s. And one must remember that this is an unelected institution that relies upon media, publicity, the public support for its life's blood. They are in control, they release the images, they choose who comes and talks to them. I mean, that's a relationship that works in Hollywood, that's a relationship that works with celebrities. It's a great open question whether it's a relationship that can work with a senior active member of the British royal family. There's a misconception that because I have worked in the entertainment industry that this would be something I would be familiar with. But even though I'd been on my show for I guess six years at that point. And working before that, I've never been part of tabloid culture. I've never been in pop culture to that degree and, and lived relatively quiet life, even though I focused so much on my job. And um, so that was a really stark difference out of the gate. But, um, and I think we were just hit so hard at the beginning with a lot of mistruths that I made the choice to not read anything positive or negative, it just didn't make sense and instead we focused all of our energies just on nurturing our relationship. On us. Yeah. On us. It was then confirmed, shortly after by Kensington Palace, that the loved up couple were engaged. So it's a standard, typical night it's for us. It's a cozy night. It was, what were we doing? Just roasting chicken roasting and having... Roasting chicken. <laughs> trying to roast chicken. Trying to roast a chicken. And it was just, a, uh, just an amazing surprise. It was so sweet and, and natural and very romantic. He got on one knee. <laughs> of course. Was it an instant yes from you? Yes. As a matter of fact, I could barely let you finish proposing. I was yeah. like, can I say yes now? She didn't even let me finish. She said, can I say yes, can I say yes now? And then, then there was hugs and I had the ring in my finger. And I was like, can I, can I give you the ring? She goes, oh, yes, the ring. <laughs> so no, it was, um, it was a really nice moment. It was just the two of us. And um, I think I managed to catch, catch her by surprise as well. So. Yeah. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle brought refreshing new life into the royal family. A modern couple for a modern generation, no longer pinned down by dated traditions, set the tone for the royal family's future.
changing and growing with the rest of society. But now that it is all official, Prince Harry, do you have that sense that the combination of the two of you, your different backgrounds, that you together represent something new for the royal family? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's something new. I think it's, um, you know, it's a, for me, it's a, an added member of the family. It's, a, it's, a, it's another, another team player as part of the, the bigger team. And, you know, for all of us, what we want to do is be able to carry out um, the right engagements, carry out our work, and try and encourage others and the younger generation to be able to see the, the world in, in the correct sense, rather than um, perhaps being dis having a, a distorted view. So, you know, the fact that I, the fact that I fell in love with Meghan so incredibly quickly was a, was a sort of confirmation to me that, that everything, every, all the stars were aligned, everything was just perfect. It was this beautiful woman just sort of literally tripped and fell into my life. I <laughs> fell into her life. And the fact that she, I, I know the fact that she'll be really unbelievably good at the job part of it as well, um, is obviously a huge, huge relief to me because she'll be able to deal with, with everything else that comes with it. But um, no, you know, we're, we're, we're a fantastic team. We know we are. and. And we'll, we, we hope to, you know, over time, try and have as much impact for all the things that we care about as, as much as possible. I am very excited about that, yeah. There is no doubt that when anybody marries into the royal family, the media immediately start looking into the background and the family of that person. I mean, with, with Meghan, it was quite easy because she'd been very public on social media and on the internet. She'd spoken about her um, biracial background, the fact that her ancestors were slaves. She'd spoken extensively about her charity work as well. So we had a really quite graphic picture of the type of woman she was, a, a feminist, somebody who believed in speaking out about her mixed race background. And I think that all of this actually was positive, in my opinion, because it gave the media a platform on which they could base their stories. Meghan and Harry said I do at Windsor's St George's Chapel in front of 600 guests and millions of viewers in one of the world's most anticipated weddings. Just after one o'clock, the couple embarked on a celebratory carriage procession through the town of Windsor. The streets were lined with thousands upon thousands of cheering well-wishers. Everyone was excited. The crowds were enormous. As you as you came up that very famous park, um, it was mobbed. I mean, both sides of where their carriage was going to go was was thousands and thousands of people stood back to back, ready to cheer them on. The applause, the cheers as they drove through Windsor were deafening. There was a tremendous amount of love and support for Meghan and Harry on their special day. It was a grand, regal display, and the newlyweds looked over the moon at their reception. October the 15th, 2018, the couple announced that they were expecting a baby in the spring of 2019. The announcement surprised the world, and many sent their congratulations and best wishes via social media, including the Archbishop of Canterbury. Doria Raglan, Meghan's mother, expressed her happiness that she was looking forward to welcoming her first grandchild. Yes, um, I'm very excited to announce that uh, Megan and myself had a baby boy um, early this morning, a very healthy boy. Um, mother and baby are doing incredibly well. Um, it's been the most amazing experience <laughs> I could ever um, possibly imagine. I, 
I haven't been at many births. Um, <laughs> this is definitely my first birth. Uh, but it was amazing, absolutely incredible. And as I said, I'm so incredibly proud of my wife. Um, and as every father and parent would ever say, you know, your, your baby is absolutely amazing, but this little thing is, is, is absolutely to die for. So I'm just over the moon. Megan, can you tell us what it's like becoming a new mum and tell us a little bit about baby Sussex as we're calling in? <laughs> um, it's magic. It's pretty amazing. And I mean, I have the two best guys in the world, so I'm really happy. Tell us a little bit about um, your son. What's, what's he like? Is he, is he sleeping well, good baby? Yes, he has the sweetest temperament. He's really calm and... Um... Mm, he gets that from. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and he's been—he's just been the dream. So it's been a special couple of days. Who does he take after? Does he look up like anyone? We still trying to figure that out. Everyone says the baby's changed so much over two weeks. We're basically sort of monitoring how the uh, how the changing process happens over this next month, really. <laughs> but his, his looks are changing every single day. Yeah. So who knows? And how you find parenting generally? What's it? Is it still a special moment? Yeah, it's great. I mean, parenting is amazing. It's, it's only been, what, two and a half days, three days? Yeah. Um, but we're just, we're just so thrilled to have, have our own little bundle of joy, um, be able to spend some precious times with him as he slowly, slowly starts to grow up. <laughs> and um, I hear you're going to to see two special people in a minute. Yes. Um, the Queen and, and the Duke. Yes, and we just bumped into the Duke as we were walking by, which was so nice. So um, it'll be a nice moment to introduce the baby to more family, and my mom's with us as well. So it's, uh, it's been a really... Nice, thank you. Thank very, you very, all very so much. much. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Excellent. And thank you, everybody, for all the well wishes and the kindness. Mm. It's, they, it just means so much. Thanks for the support. Thank you. Behind the tall walls of Windsor Castle is where fewer than 25 guests were invited to witness the newest royal baptism. Those invited taken discreetly to the tiny private chapel. Outside though, the streets were thronging with people. Those hoping to catch a glimpse of the royal christening though, were left disappointed. We do pay for the royal family, including uh, Meghan and Harry. And I think that they could have given us a little, you know, um, a little something. I think it should be public, you know, it always has been, why, why change it? It's their decision, it's their family, um, it's not as if they're direct uh, in line. And this royal watcher says the public may have to get used to this royal couple's desire for privacy. Well, it seems to be the case that Harry has decided he wants his little boy to have more of a private life. He feels he's a long way from the throne and wants to enjoy some type of privacy. But it could be a problem because no matter what you do, he is growing up in a raw goldfish bowl. He has got two of the most famous parents in the world. Today's christening is a very different royal event, part of the continuing desire by the Duke and Duchess of Sussex to raise their son Archie out of the spotlight. And they're a couple determined to do things their own way. Over the last few years, the unconventional decisions made by Prince Harry and Meghan Markle have led to widespread controversy and scrutiny from both the public and the press. Before the scandals, before the family fallouts, and before the dramatic exit, there was just a charming young couple in love. through this relationship, we've seen examples of Harry trying to protect Meghan from the scrutiny. You have to remember, Meghan comes in the legacy of Princess Diana, and Harry saw the way his mother was treated by the press. And I think he's very keenly 
aware of how that happened and, and ensuring that that doesn't happen to Megan. The decision to move away from Central London to go to Frogmore Cottage and move to Windsor is very much about protecting Megan. You know, they had just redecorated the place in Kensington. They had just done it up the way they wanted to when they announced they were actually decamping and moving to Windsor. By moving to Windsor, Harry and Megan are hoping to preserve some semblance of normalcy for themselves and for their child. Even if you look at the birth of the new baby, whereas Kate Middleton was trotted out in hosiery and full makeup just hours after delivering her babies, Megan said from the beginning, I won't be doing that. They didn't even announce she was in labor until after the baby was safely born. All the way through the birth, even in the last weeks of her pregnancy, Megan was not seen. And all the way through her birth, Megan has maintained a determination, along with Harry, to keep certain things private, to keep protected their family. And they are not following the royal script. They are consistently deviating from what's been done before. And some people think it's admirable and some people think it's not. But ultimately, Megan and Harry are doing things their own way. On January the 13th, 2020, royal watchers were on the edge of their seats as Harry and Meghan entered what was infamously called a crisis meeting with Her Majesty the Queen, Prince Charles and Prince William. The royal family's future was hanging on the outcome of this critical talk. After several tense hours, Buckingham Palace announced with a heavy heart that arrangements had been made for Harry and Meghan to leave royal duties behind and pursue an independent future. Public reaction was divided, to say the least. Whilst some wished the couple nothing but happiness and success, others felt resentment in their choice to abandon crown and country. There's no doubt that the reaction inside the palace was just as divided. The now free couple announced a new future of financial independence. Stepping back from the royal family, but insisted they would continue to support their causes and Her Majesty the Queen, they shared plans to split their time between North America and the UK. And just like that, as quickly as the whirlwind romance had started back in July 2016, less than three years on, they were gone. Despite the infamous crisis meeting to decide their future on January the 13th, the couple announced on the 31st of March 2020 that they were officially leaving the royal family, would no longer use their titles, and would become financially independent. As a first step into independence, the couple founded Archwell Inc., a non-profit foundation for change. The couple founded Archwell Productions and signed multiple huge media deals with Netflix and Spotify for a series of documentary and podcast productions, reportedly worth around £18 million. Pounds. Uh, I think there is now uh, an allegation of racism hanging over a member or members of the royal family. We don't know who, as we said earlier, not the Queen, not the Duke of Edinburgh, but beyond that, we don't know who Harry and Meghan uh, wouldn't say. And nor do we know the context in which this remark was made, but we do know, from what we've heard, that both Harry, when he heard it, and Meghan, when it was passed on, took offence to it, and therefore that is an issue uh, for them. On March the 7th, CBS aired the landmark interview led by TV legend Oprah Winfrey. The two-hour interview has caused an incredible fallout, the magnitude of which still cannot be fully understood. It was the interview that some within Buckingham Palace must have feared. But Harry and Meghan Markle's discussion with Oprah was more revealing, explosive, and potentially damaging to the royal family than many could have imagined. Throughout the TV special, both Harry and Meghan spoke openly, delivering accusations and rebukes that outweighed even Princess Diana's landmark interview more than two decades earlier. Harry claimed that when they left the UK for Canada, his father, now King Charles III, stopped returning his calls, and this left them feeling they were on their own. According to Harry, the royal family completely cut him off financially around the first quarter of 2020, when the couple first decided to become independent. 
This left him concerned for his safety and the safety of his family. Perhaps most troubling of all were Megan's claims that she experienced real and frightening suicidal thoughts as a result of such intense tabloid scrutiny and isolation at the palace. Megan also claimed that it was disparaging that the palace refused to correct false statements about her. And also, I think there's slightly wider questions for us as a society. Carrie said that he left in part because of racism uh, in the UK. What does that mean for us? Do we need to look at ourselves a bit more? And I think then on the general point for, for Buckingham Palace, why is it that you know, Meghan was unable to sort of fit in? Why couldn't she get the help she needed when she desperately needed it? Although I should also point out, last week, there was that bullying complaint revealed against Meghan that the Human Resources Department had to look into as well. So there's a lot there. Two years after Prince Harry and Meghan Markle stepped back as senior members of the royal family, the couple returned to the UK for an exceptional reason. Harry and Meghan saw the Queen on a low-key visit before attending the 2022 Invictus Games in the Netherlands. The secret visit came almost a year after Prince Philip's funeral, which had been the last time Prince Harry was believed to have reunited with the Queen and the extended royal family. On September the 8th, 2022, while Meghan and Harry were in London preparing to attend a charity event, Queen Elizabeth II died at Balmoral Castle in Scotland. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. The couple chose not to attend the charity event that night, with Meghan staying in London and her husband traveling to Balmoral. On September the 10th, 2022, the new Prince and Princess of Wales, William and Catherine, were joined by the Duke and Duchess of Sussex at Windsor to view the tributes to the Queen and spent time talking to the crowds. There were mixed reactions from the people there. This was the first time since March 2020 that the two couples had been seen together. The couple then went on to attend the late Queen's funeral, with Harry marching behind the coffin along with his family. When it was finally announced that the Queen had died, there was an extraordinary outpouring of grief amongst uh, the nation because, you know, the majority of, of, of the Queen's subjects had never known um, another monarch. And it was kind of the end of an era. It wasn't just her death, it was the end of an era. It was end of the Elizabethan age as we know it. And of course it was all so dramatic and so beautifully staged that that made it even more poignant. The, the you know, the soldiers, the, the wonderful music, the people that used to work for the Queen, walking behind her coffin was very, very moving. They were just silent, completely silent. You could hear a pin drop, I remember when Diana died and the day of her funeral, you, you, could, you could actually, you could just hear the birds, you couldn't hear anything else, no sound from the crowd. And that is a sort of real high emotion. On December the 8th, the All Access documentary series was released, titled Harry and Meghan. The series is unlike anything seen before, only close in comparison to the Panorama interview with Princess Diana in 1995. Years of stories half told and whispered through the media were expanded and clarified. She's becoming a royal rock star. And then... Everything changed. There's a hierarchy of the family. You know, there's leaking, but there's also planting of stories. There was a war against Meghan to suit other people's agendas. It's about hatred. It's about race. It's a dirty game. 
pain and suffering of women marrying into this institution, this feeding frenzy. I realized they're never going to protect you. I was terrified. I didn't want history to repeat itself. If the trailers are anything to go by, the tone of it's going to be extremely uncomfortable for people on both sides of the Atlantic, and that's going to make family reconciliation even harder than it already is. You'll watch that series and think, the royal family need looking after, they've come out of it better, or you'll be on the side of Harry and Meghan and think, wow, they had to put up with a lot and I'm on their side. For some reason, they feel very wronged, which I'm looking forward to finding out why. But they can't ask for privacy when they've made the Netflix series because everyone now is opening up a can of worms. There's no going back. There is no going back. This was the couple's attempt to get across their own side of the story and their meeting and attempts to integrate into the royal family through their departure. The Sussex brand, both in the UK and America, uh, is being helped in one way uh, by this Netflix documentary series by bringing uh, the Sussexes back onto our radar screens, if not our TV screens. So uh, there is perhaps a fear that out of sight means out of mind. Uh, and by uh, a cooperating with Netflix on a documentary like this, it gets us all talking about them again uh, and it keeps them uh, in the limelight and it keeps their, their brand uh, of Harry and Meghan uh, alive. The couple's first introduction was via an Instagram post Harry revealed. Meghan spoke about the whirlwind pressure of meeting Prince William and Princess Kate for the first time. Meghan claims that her wardrobe was strictly controlled during her tenure as a royal. Barred from bright colors to avoid clashing with the queen, Meghan chose to wear camel and beige in order to blend in and not stand out. Harry, the Duke of Sussex, is seen in the show proclaiming that the royals don't marry for love. Instead, they feel incredible pressure to marry someone that fits the mold. The fallout from this series has seemingly caught the entire world in fierce debate. And it seems everybody has something to say about what the couple addressed. I think if he wants to get some across, I think we, you know, that's one thing that we always do. We always hide things, and that's why you end up with, sadly, so much mental health. And so I think it's important that, you, that, that they can. Royals should be able to express themselves to everyone else. But I think the problem is it's the way it's been done. You know, doing it on Netflix, obviously for money, I think if he'd done it differently in other ways, for example, there was money but it was donated to charities and that kind of thing. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to... It's, it's a difficult one. It's a really difficult one. But I think if it had been done differently, maybe people would have seen it differently. And I keep saying, I wonder what the end game is. And what I mean by that is, what, what, I wonder what he wants to achieve from it. Because, you know, if we're going to be realistic, uh, over the centuries, monarchies have never always been perfect, and there's been there's been issues, and things have gone wrong, or they've done things wrong, or whatever. And, and sometimes you get people that try to fight against them, including family, and it never ends well. You know, the, the, because monarchy is not just about. A, this is where people get confused. Not it's not a king and queen. It's not a prince and princess. It's it's, it's more. It's it's more than that. It's, it's when he used the word institution or a firm, that is, or a company, that that's it. And and that will do everything to protect itself. I think if that's what he's trying to fight against, I, I just don't know how that's going to pan out. I don't know how it's going to work, and that's what I don't get is what they, what he wants to, what will be the achievement at the end of it, other than causing so much upset to him and his family, and his father, and his brother. That's the bit I'm confused at. I just, I would love it if they could all sort it out somehow. On the 10th of January 2023, Prince Harry's autobiography Spare was released. This highly anticipated book tells his side of the story from the very beginning and delivers lurid detail about his life. However, only days before its release in the UK, 
A leaked copy of the book surfaced, with copies going on sale early in Spain. There's been parts of it shared that shocked, surprised me, because there's things that he's talked about that royals just don't talk about. I can expect it of a celebrity, I can expect it even maybe from a politician. But when it comes to royals, there's certain things and certain parts of bodies and things they don't talk about, and, and he's been talking about it. So it's a very, it's a very frank, I suppose, frank, and, you know, he, he wants people to get, to understand what makes him tick, I think, is the easiest way to explain it. Confidently sold at half price already. I think it's terrible for him uh, to reveal his difficulties and unhappiness in public like this. I mean, maybe he thinks it helps him, but I can't see how. I think if he were truly committed to serving other people, he wouldn't be serving his interests as he is. To be, I suspect, an element of whinging in this book, which I think, you know, we've kind of got the message now. And if he was to come out with some deep, dark secrets about the royal family that we don't know, I would think that would reflect very badly on him. From the leaked Spanish copy, news outlets in the UK shared that in spare, Harry recounts how he was allegedly physically attacked by his older brother, Prince William. Going into never heard before detail, he describes how their relationship fell apart over Harry's relationship with Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex. In a moment of high emotion, Harry states William called Meghan difficult, rude, and abusive. Harry shared how William grabbed me by the collar, ripping my necklace, and knocked me to the floor. This account of the altercation ends with William's suggestion to keep it from Meghan, and although Harry kept it to himself, Meghan noticed the bruises on his back. He recalls she wasn't that surprised and wasn't all that angry, and instead, she was terribly sad. Other revelations of the book reveal that Harry killed 25 people while serving in Afghanistan and admits that he took cocaine age 17. These claims angered the military and posed a potential risk to his US visa. I think Prince Harry's uh, comments about Afghanistan are ill-judged and potentially harmful both to him, but also for the, to the, uh, the British Army as a whole. Uh, and in the first case, I think that uh, he's already under security threat, but specifying and spelling out so publicly that he's killed 25 Taliban, or well, it's nothing to be ashamed of. In fact, it's something to be proud of. Um, it won't, you know, it will refocus and I think probably re-energize those people who ha had in the past thought of taking revenge against him for doing so. So I think that's a pretty serious uh, implication for his personal security. Harry also recounts fond memories of his time with his mother and his late grandmother, Queen Elizabeth. He describes immensely private conversations and also mentions attending his grandfather's funeral, after which his father, King Charles III, asks William and Harry not to make his life a misery. Well, in Harry's memoir, there's a reported conversation after Prince Philip's funeral where Charles says to his sons, please, boys, don't make my final years miserable. Now, we have no way of knowing that's true or not. Like a lot of the stories in Harry's book, it might be exaggerated, it might be completely false, it might be a verbatim recording of what happened. But I do feel that his referring to his final years is an interesting idea because he has no way of knowing how long he's going to live. I mean, none of us do. But what I think he wants to do during his reign is for it not to be miserable, for it to be an uplifting and cathartic experience. Because I think what he would like is that when he dies, the country to be in a better place than when he became king. I mean, we can only hope that he's proved right, but certainly the spat between his sons is not going to go away anytime soon. Harry seems to be doing everything to avoid responsibility as he claims William and Kate laughed at his infamous Nazi costume he wore to a party in 2005, which he described in their Netflix documentary as one of the biggest mistakes in my life. 
My feeling about the Harry and Meghan situation is that Harry is an attention-seeking imbecile who has created a difficulty for his family that never needed to be created. I feel sorry for him on a human level. I feel sorry for what he's been through. I feel sorry for all of the things he went through as a child. The fact that he has decided to take out his frustrations and vexation, not just on his family, but on it now seems the world at large, means that it's a story that it's never needed to exist and it's just going on and on and on. In a sit-down interview released before the book with 60 Minutes, Harry shares his wish to be a part of the family again. Here we see Harry reaching out emotionally, suggesting that he wants his father and his brother back. So on that level, perhaps uh, a scope for reconciliation, but no contrition on his part. Amazing and surprising and fantastic if this book put all that all to rest and said from now on, we're going to be a family. It's quite OK for Harry and Meghan to live in America, but to come over here and be part of the family in the holidays. So the thing about the Royal Family is the biggest thing to them is trust. That's the, that's the be all and end all is trust. And once you've lost that, it's gone. And I think, I think that will have been lost. I think that will have gone. However, Harry is still the king's son. He's only got two boys. I know the king loves and adores both boys equally. I, I witnessed that a lot on many occasions, so I know how much that love is. Just that the queen loved him as well. And I don't think anything could change that. I really don't. I really believe that that kind of love cannot be uh, destroyed. But from the public point of view, there is the embarrassment part and the awkwardness of that. And I think that part, he's closed, he will, they will, a door will be closed in that part. But behind the scenes, as far as the, the love between a father and son, I don't know, I, I'd like to think that one day that will be, that that's fixable, one day they can fix that. Even though the relationship and the public might never be the same again, it'd be nice to think that one day behind closed doors they can, they can heal that part of the relationship, which I think is, that is possible, I think. that despite Harry and Meghan's attempt to outrun the media and start a new life in Los Angeles, that storm has caught up with them. Once again, they're on every front page and in everyone's mouths. Their attempt at privacy backfired, but their attempt to tell their side of their own story seems to have only emboldened both sides of opinion. <laughs> 